Two years ago, I was presented with an exciting challenge. A customer approached me with a request for an epoxy serving board combining six different colors. Despite my limited experience as a woodworker, I confidently agreed to take on the challenge. In this video, I'm going to show the detailed process of how I made a Rainbow River epoxy table. I'll show how overconfidence turned into a $250 mistake, how I redeemed myself creating a one-of-a-kind coffee table base, and in the end, auction the piece and donate those funds to help vulnerable youth. Stick around to see how I made the Rainbow River epoxy table the double K way. Since making one, I've been repeatedly asked how to create one of these rainbow epoxy pieces. Rather than go through the underwhelming process of recreating an epoxy serving board, I'm going to use the same techniques, but to make a coffee table. This build is an interesting one as it combines two divisive aesthetics. Epoxy has gained significant attention in woodworking, especially when used in river tables. Similarly, the rainbow color scheme has sparked contrasting opinions. So bear with me as I combine the two, the finished result is worth seeing. Up to this point, what I've done is determine the layout for a coffee table sized at 49 by 21 inches. After marking out the rough lines with a scrap plywood template, I'm using the Festool TS75 track saw to cut the slabs to size. Although this track saw is incredibly accurate and quite powerful, cutting the slabs to size in one pass usually causes binding and burning. The remainder of the cuts I'm showing one pass, but whenever I use the track saw I take on average three to five passes to get through a piece. The slabs that I've selected for this table are curly black walnut slabs that I got from Alderfer Lumber in central Pennsylvania. They arrived almost entirely debarked, however, there is a small section that was still intact on one of the slabs. Using a dull chisel and a hammer, I was able to easily remove it, being careful to not mar the edge. With the bark removed, the thin skin under it, known as the cambium, also needs to be removed. I find that wire wheels tend to be a bit too aggressive when trying to preserve the live edge, and that's where these nylon wheels are the perfect solution. If you've seen any epoxy builds in the past, you're likely familiar with this mold building process. I'm not going to claim the method I show here is the best method for building molds, but I will say that this technique is essentially foolproof and leak proof. I've been pouring epoxy for about two and a half years now and have yet to have a leak from a mold. When most people make their molds, they use melamine and cover it with an anti-stick agent like a mold release spray. I've used melamine in the past, but I have found that MDF is more reusable long term as the screw holes aren't as likely to strip out. I can't speak firsthand on using mold release as I have yet to try it, but I've heard the stories about the excess spray getting onto wood pieces and compromising the epoxy bond. Or when not properly applying it to the mold, the sheet of melamine sticks to the entire piece and has to be chiseled off. Neither of which I want to experience, so I opt to use MDF and cover it with packaging tape or sheathing tape. Here I'm using Grip Right sheathing tape as it's a cost effective option with the same performance as the other name brand alternatives. One of the biggest advantages of building a mold like this, with the walls screwed on from the sides rather than having them screwed down into the bottom, is that the bottom piece can easily be cut to the desired finish size of the piece. I tend to cut the bottom of the mold one inch oversized in both length and width to account for final dimensioning cuts. Also, when screwing the walls on from the side rather than the top, you're not creating another potential point of escape for epoxy. Another thing I often see with epoxy work is the use of latex caulk to seal the edges of a mold. When I first started pouring epoxy, I tried using caulk, but immediately found three major issues. First, is that the caulk takes much more time to cure than the silicone alternatives. Second, is that it cures brittle and can chip off or flake into your epoxy. And third, is that it's very hard to get off the molds to reuse them. I prefer using this advanced formula silicone, which is a bit more expensive, I think $12 a bottle, but I've had better results using it. With the mold watertight and the slabs fully prepped, I can start the process of pouring the base layer of epoxy. For the first pour, I'm using Super Clear's Liquid Glass, which is their deep pour product, rated for 2 to 4 inch pours. Traditionally, when using a deep pour product, the entire piece is poured at once. However, I'm pouring this table in three different layers. After mixing the epoxy in a 2 to 1 ratio, I distribute the epoxy evenly into six containers, one for each color that will go into the piece. The pigments I used are Merlot, Vivid Orange, Tuscan Sunset, Deep Blue Sea, and Purple Haze by Black Diamond Pigments. The green pigment used is Dark Ocean Green by Eye Candy Pigments. There will be links to each of the pigments and other products used throughout the video in the video description. These links will be affiliate links, which means any purchase made using them results in a small portion going to me. Thank you in advance if you use any. The questions I get asked most about the rainbow pieces are, how do you separate the colors? 
How long after pouring do you pull the dams? And how do you get the defined swirls? To address the first, as weird as it may seem, I actually use aluminum foil as a dam. The aluminum foil being malleable allows for perfectly shaping it to a contoured live edge, which minimizes how much of one color can bleed into another. As far as when to pull the dams, I usually wait 10 to 12 hours, but truthfully, I babysit the pour, making sure to pull the foil once it's slightly thickened. 72 hours later, the base layer is fully cured. I scuff the surface so that the next layer can mechanically bond to both the live edge and the base layer. This next layer is the one that's visible when finished. For this pour, instead of using the 2 to 1 deep pour epoxy, I use Superclear's 1 to 1 tabletop epoxy. This product is rated for a maximum pour depth of a quarter inch and cures in 24 hours. The same process from the base layer is followed. Calculate volume, distribute into 6 containers, mix pigment, insert dams, and pour. Because of the higher viscosity and faster cure time, I pull the dams after 15 minutes. The epoxy will start to set up within the hour, so as soon as I pull the dams, I begin blending the colors at the transitions. Once the transitions are blended, I begin repeatedly swirling the pour from each end to the other to create a nice gradation of colors across the rainbow. When swirling, it's important to skim only the top eighth inch or so. If you go too deep, micro bubbles will get trapped in this more viscous epoxy. Once the second layer of epoxy is cured, I scuff the epoxy river again and lightly scuff the sealed live edges. The warm weather came just in time for this third pour, and I didn't feel comfortable pouring the final gallon and a half of deep pour outside in the humidity in mid-80s. So I brought the piece inside where the temperature stays around 70 degrees, and I poured the final layer of clear. Although the deep pour product cures in 72 hours, I let the pour sit for 10 days before demolding. This ensures that the product has reached peak hardness and there's no chance of warping the piece when demolding or machining into epoxy that isn't fully cured. Here you can see how easy the demolding process is when screwing from the sides and just how easily the piece pops out of the mold without destroying the MDF. Assuming the wood was flat before pouring the epoxy, the piece will come out of the mold mostly flat. Through the curing process, the epoxy actually shrinks. The shrinking can put strain on the wood, causing it to slightly twist or cup. This piece came out basically dead flat, but when I poured the clear layer, I over poured so that I wouldn't lose much thickness from shrinkage. This left for removing about 1 16th inch of excess epoxy. I use this homemade router sled for pieces like this that are 5 foot and smaller. This router sled is simply a flat melamine bottom with equal height walls on each side and a plywood carriage for the router. If you intend on using this process to flatten pieces, it's ideal to have a plunge router and flattening bit. This 2.5 inch Amana slab flattening bit makes relatively quick work of the process, but it's still time consuming and incredibly messy. I'm very fortunate in that I have a cabinet shop 15 minutes away from me that lets me rent time on their wide belt sander. This wide belt has a sanding capacity of 40 inches wide, and although not shown, we changed the abrasive belt four times, progressing 50, 100, 120, and finishing at 150 grit. Back at home, after letting the top rest overnight, it's time to cut to final size. If you have a track saw, but don't have these DeWalt track clamps, I highly recommend them. They're more affordable than some of the alternatives and fit most, if not all, tracks. Whenever I'm making finished cuts with a track saw, I make sure to use these so that there's no wandering of the track, which could result in a non-straight edge. As mentioned before, although I'm only showing one pass, these cuts are made in three to five passes. The order of these cuts may seem insignificant, but to ensure the most square piece, start by ripping one long side, then rip the other long side parallel to it. Finally, cross cut the short sides with the edge guide referencing the same side. Avoid cutting in the order of long, short, long, short, as it can amplify errors and lead to a parallelogram shape instead of a rectangle. With the top mostly complete, I divert my attention to the coffee table base. In reality, these processes were happening simultaneously, but I'm showing it now for the sake of making the process easy to follow. Most of the tables that I've done in the past have been a top that was assembled to a steel base of some sort. Wanting to challenge myself and create something entirely unique, I chose to make complementing walnut bases. If you've seen my first YouTube video that I published last year, you know that in the past I had to use sleds on my drum sander or planer for face jointing. You also got the comical experience of me resawing an 8 inch wide board by hand. Fortunately, these are problems of the past. I've spent the last 9 months working on a long list of commissions to buy the tools I deem necessary to improve my woodworking, filming, and editing. Along the way, I was fortunate enough to start a partnership with Laguna. 
my garage is now equipped with their 8 inch Sheertech joiner and 18 BX bandsaw. The milling process that used to take me an entire evening now only takes an hour. After jointing one face and one edge of every piece, I'm left with a material thickness of around 2 inches. For the bases I'm making, I need the material thickness to be about 1 and a quarter to 1 and an eighth. Using a feather board to apply consistent pressure against the fence, I resaw all the material down to a little over 1 and a quarter inch. This doesn't leave a perfectly flat face, but I'll take care of that later when milling to final dimensions. As you can see, the resawing produced a significant amount of usable offcuts. I set that material off to the side for my next YouTube build. You're going to want to subscribe to see this one because I've never seen anything like what I have planned, and I promise, no epoxy and no rainbow. If you've ever wondered what three years of offcuts put into one piece looks like, this is going to be the project for you. With the material now surfaced on all four sides, I stack and sticker it to let it reacclimate. A couple days later, the wood is fully acclimated and stable. Although you might assume the material is still flat, after removing so much material from each side, the pieces move slightly. I join each of the faces and edges that were previously jointed to re-establish flat and square. The unjointed face is passed through the planer, removing very little material to get two flat faces and a consistent thickness of one and an eighth inch. With the material flat and square on all sides, each piece is run through the table saw to a finished width of three inches. Earlier I mentioned wanting to make these bases very unique. Obviously just walnut isn't going to do that. I wanted to tie the rainbow aesthetic of the top into the base somehow. I considered different ways to do it with epoxy, but didn't think I could get the colors to be as vibrant and I didn't think I could get clean lines. I reached out to Ben Paik of Wobie Design who does amazing work with skateboard veneers. I asked Ben if he was interested in a collab and as much as he liked the idea, he couldn't commit due to recently becoming a first time father. He was really helpful and pointed me in the direction of Roar Rocket, a company that specializes in dyed veneers and skateboard kits. I bought their vacuum pressing kit, two of every color they have, watched a couple skateboard lamination videos, and I thought I knew exactly what I was doing. You're about to see how that overconfidence bites me in the butt and how this veneer and epoxy lamination turns into a disaster real fast. Everything you just saw me do, don't do. Mistake number one for this application was using epoxy, but more importantly, using this much epoxy. I chose to use that as the adhesive for the lamination because I assumed I would need the extra open time. As demoralizing and stressful as the lamination process was, the demolding ended up being even worse. I got to see just how bad the result was. The epoxy adhered the plat into the lamination, which turned a 10 second process into a 10 minute process. When pulling off the plat and I slipped and cut myself with a sharp epoxy edge, so overall, one out of 10 rating for this experience, and the one is only because I learned what not to do. These significant seams and voids are the result of that over-application of epoxy between layers. After being humiliated by the process, I reached out to Roar Rocket to discuss my hiccups. They replaced the material at a 50% discount and the owner, Ted, offered to call me to provide some insight. We spoke for about 20 minutes and he filled me in on all the tips and tricks to have a successful lamination. I realized after the first lamination that doubling up each color and having 16 veneers in the piece looked too busy and it wasn't the aesthetic I was going for. Ted mentioned that it would be an easier process to achieve what I was going for by ripping each of the pieces in half. The biggest bit of information that he provided is that epoxy isn't the ideal adhesive for these applications. A PVA glue like Titebind 3 will actually soak into the wood fibers, which gives two benefits. It makes the material more malleable, which is likely to create a flatter lamination in the end. And when actually soaking into the wood and not sitting on the surface like the epoxy did, you don't get those prominent seams. The one downside to the PVA glue is the open time is much shorter, so the process does feel a bit rushed. Demolding this second lamination was quite the relief. No mess, no cuts, and the aesthetic was spot on. Now that I have a successful rainbow lamination, you may be wondering what I'm going to do with this and how it will be used with the table base. After jointing an edge to create a flat reference face, I set up the bandsaw to resaw the lamination into 8th inch veneers. This is one of those ironic processes in woodworking where I'm going full circle. I'm starting with veneers, laminating them into a block, just to cut them back down into veneers. I centered the veneer on the walnut base stock and that's when I knew I'd made the right decision and this was going to be the perfectly subtle yet vibrant pop that I was looking for. Rather than rip the base pieces in half and glue the rainbow piece in the middle so that it could be seen from both sides, I chose to clear out the material in the center and press the rainbow veneer into the walnut so that it only shows on the inside face. 
After installing a flat top blade in the table saw, I centered the material and started making passes to clear out the recess. I snuck up on the fit to ensure I didn't overcut, which could create large gaps. I was going for tight enough to friction fit in, but not so tight that once glue was applied, the wood swelling wouldn't allow the veneer to be pressed in. Gluing up a piece that fits this nicely doesn't require any clamps, so I apply some type on 3, press the veneer, and let it sit overnight. While the glue cured for the pressed inlays, I took some of the leftover rainbow veneer and started on a branding addition to the underside of the table. I will get to that in a moment, but first I want to mention the purpose of this project. I'm not going to push any political narrative here, and I'm very hopeful the comment section refrains from doing so as well, but the intent of this project is to raise money to donate to the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is a 24-7 crisis support service for youth. They're a nonprofit organization that provides counseling and other resources specializing in self-harm prevention efforts. I will have an auction listing in the video description. If you're interested in owning this piece, simply because you want to support this cause or because you want to own and admire this piece in person, check out the link. Whether this piece sells for $2,000 or $20,000, every dollar will be donated to the organization. And for those that are curious, the material cost to make this was around $1,200 US dollars, but the potential impact of these donated funds is priceless. If this piece falls outside your budget, but you want to show your support for this cause, please consider donating to the Trevor Project individually. If you'd like to show your support for my creative endeavor, subscribing to this channel and sharing this video are worth more to me than you can imagine. Also, I recently dropped a merch line with various high quality options. There's a link in the description if you're interested. And again, I appreciate your support in any way, shape, and form. If you made it this far in the video, that's good enough for me. Now, back to this logo tag. After book matching the rainbow veneer, drum sanding it flat, squaring it off to 3 inches length, and routing a recess for it, I chisel the remaining material to the line established with a marking knife. When doing this, I take care to remove only small bits of material at a time so that I don't crush the grain, creating a gap outside of the inlay. Off camera, I sanded an off cut from the slab to get dust that would match the color. I spread that along the outline of the inlay while gluing up to ensure any potential gaps are filled. Once the glue is set up, I can use a hand plane to take off the excess material that's proud of the surface, and then I can use the orbital sander to hit it with 120 grit to see how I did with the chisel work. A little water pop to show off the colors, and I'm pretty pumped with that result. For the final base design, I wanted something that could easily be assembled and disassembled to allow for ease of shipping. The design I settled on is a trapezoid base on each end. This shape requires an angle 7 degrees off of 90, aka 83 degrees, in hindsight, I think I would have preferred the aesthetic of 3 to 5 degrees off of 90, but 7 degrees is suitable for a coffee table base. I made a crosscut sled with one end cut at 83 degrees for cutting the pieces to length. Using a sled like this ensures consistency and the zero clearance backing mitigates grain blowout. By the way, all those angled off cuts that get made, don't toss those. They'll come in handy shortly. Before gluing up the bases, I laid out marks for my mounting solution. I intentionally do this before gluing up as once the bases are together, accessibility for drilling the holes becomes a problem. To mount the bases to the tabletop, I'm using threaded inserts and connector bolts. As previously mentioned, this helps with ease of assembly and disassembly. Recessing the bolt heads makes for a cleaner aesthetic overall, so I bring the tops of the bases to the drill press. Using a Forstner bit, I hog out the material for the bolt head recess, then use a twist bit to drill out the mounting holes. To allow for any potential expansion and contraction of the wood in the tabletop, I oversize the hole by about an eighth inch. This also gives some leeway in lining up the bolt with the threaded insert when assembling. As you can see here with the amount of play in the hole, any sort of seasonal wood movement is sufficiently accounted for. For the joinery, I'm using everyone's favorite green tool to hate on, the Festool Domino. The Domino is an accurate, fast, and efficient way to create loose mortise and tenon joints. Without the use of the domino, this joint relies solely on the glue bond between end grain and face grain. Any end grain glue up is inherently weaker than the alternatives using face grain or edge grain. The domino provides the added benefit of more edge grain and face grain to glue contact inside the mortise. The floating tenon also provides some added shear force resistance and aids in alignment. As much as people complain about the use of the tool in modern woodworking joinery applications, it's a reliable and efficient method that doesn't come with a steep learning curve. If the domino is outside your budget, a doweling jig can accomplish many of the same operations. There's a moment in every project where it all comes together, when the idea you've had in your head becomes an actual tangible piece. 
It's these moments that remind me why I do this and continue to pursue creating better, more intricate, and more unique pieces. These moments remind me that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Wow. Remember those angled offcuts I mentioned that needed to be saved? Well, this is why. The angle complements the angle of the base's splay, meaning they can be used as clamping calls to apply parallel force to the joint. I use double-sided tape to fix them to the wood. The double-sided tape is strong enough that the clamping force won't pop the blocks off, but post glue up can easily be taken off without damaging the surface. I thought this would be a low stress glue up, but I swear as soon as a glue bottle is open and the clock starts ticking, I start panicking. I used far too much glue on the joints, which required a significant amount of cleaning up squeeze out in hard to reach areas. Off camera, I used a wet towel and wiped it all away. With these bases in the clamps, all of the stressful parts of the project are finally complete. I could have worked on these bases the next day, but knowing they are load bearing and I was probably still stressed from the glue up, I waited two days until taking the bases out of clamps. A few taps on these calls that were adhered with double sided tape and they pop right off. Like I mentioned before, there's also no damage to the surface. Before mounting the bases to the top, I need to soften all the edges with the trim router. Breaking the edge with an eighth inch round over bit gives a softer look and feel to the pieces. With the amount these bases are being moved around and the amount of potential bumping the edge could take, softening it minimizes the likelihood of an edge splintering or fracturing. The outer edges are no problem, but the bearing of the router bit restricts it from cutting inside the tight corners of the joints. To smooth the transition, a combination of light filing and hand sanding is needed. There isn't much material that needs removing, so the shaping process requires a bit of finesse. Through past coffee table builds, I found a good distance for the base to be inset is 2-4 to four inches. That distance will change dependent on the overall table length, but this range seems to be the most aesthetically balanced in my experience. With drilling locations marked, I drilled the holes for the threaded inserts and used a countersink bit on each hole so that the inserts don't sit proud of the surface. If it looks like I drilled these holes at an angle, I promise it was just a poorly angled camera shot. Watching back this footage as I edit, I think that's where I have the most room for improvement with future videos. Throughout this project, I was learning how to use this new camera. This video is the first footage recorded on it and my first time using a quality camera for anything other than pictures. So, how do you feel about the footage up to this point? I'm genuinely curious for feedback so that I know how to create a more enjoyable experience for you, the viewers. The amount of sanding that I show for these bases is a gross underrepresentation of the work actually put into them. Because of the shape, it wasn't feasible to sand the inside faces with an orbital. Any imperfections on the outer faces were cleaned up with an orbital, but the rest of the sanding was done by hand with a 120 and 180 grit block and a foam pad. I spent an exhausting two hours hand sanding these bases, but I was rewarded with an ironic gift from Mother Nature. When wanting to leave a wood feeling and looking natural, but also being sufficiently protected, I use Rubio Monocoat. The finish is a 3 to 1 ratio hard wax oil that's easily applied with a white scotch Bright pad. The finish is essentially foolproof. Sand to 180, apply, leave on for 15 minutes, and then buff off. The only thing to be cautious of is that you remove all the excess finish. If you can still feel resistance when wiping with a shop towel, it needs more wiping down. The surface should look finished, but feel dry. If you thought the two hours that I spent on hand sanding the bases was excessive, you definitely don't want to know the time it took to sand the tabletop. To get the clear epoxy looking transparent, it has to be meticulously dry sanded, wet sanded, and then polished. I'm not going to show the process in depth as that will be heavily focused on in a future build. Basically, I dry sanded the entire piece with 120 and then 180, then sanded just the epoxy with 240, 320, 400, 600, and 800. I followed that up with wet sanding just the epoxy with 1000, 2000, and 4000 grit. I finished the process by buffing and then polishing the epoxy with an auto compound. The downside of sanding this high and then polishing is that any imperfections that were missed aren't usually visible until the polishing is complete. I assure you, I didn't nail this the first time, but for the sake of keeping the pace going, I'm not going to show you how I went back and dry sanded at 600 grit to work back up to the polished finish. Like the bases, I'm finishing the top with Rubio Monocoat. I use a spreader to cover the surface, buff the finish into the grain with a white scotch bright pad on my sander, and then 15 minutes later, I use blue shop towels to wipe off any excess. 
I'm not showing this process with the bases, but after the first coat of finish cured on both the bases and top, I lightly scuffed the surface with a gray scotch bright pad. I'm extremely careful to not abrade the epoxy as then I'd have to re-sand and polish the entire surface. With a second coat of Rubio, the same process is followed as before. Apply, buff in with sander and a white pad, and after 15 minutes, wipe away excess with chop towels and a microfiber. Having to continuously move and flip this piece around, the polished epoxy gets minor imperfections in the finish. As a final step before completion, I touch up the epoxy with a finishing polish and pad. Wipe off the excess compound, and finally, this top is done. So, here it is. The Rainbow River Epoxy Table. Knowing the potential impact of the auction for this piece makes seeing the finished product that much sweeter. At this point, after seeing the entire process and now seeing the finished build, I'm curious, what are your thoughts? If you enjoyed the build or the video, or even better, if you enjoyed both, don't forget to subscribe and share. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next build.